Welcome to Insider Events, the future of finance, disrupting the ordinary, presented by Grayscale. Here's our host, Insider Deputy Editor, Meredith Mazzelli. Technology is transforming our financial lives. Whether you work in the finance industry or you're a consumer of financial services, the future of finance, well, it's here. I'm Meredith Mazzilli, Deputy Editor for Finance and Legal here at Insider. We've gathered together experts at the intersection of finance and tech. Some of the biggest names in finance will discuss the next wave of innovation. Thanks so much for being with us, here with us, and thank you to Grayscale for presenting this event. We'd love for you to share your thoughts using the hashtag Future of Finance. We also want this to be an engaging conversation, so check out the dashboard at the bottom of the screen where you can submit questions for our panelists. First up, Insider Finance reporter Carter Johnson will hear from two experts on how legacy financial institutions are leaning in to digital transformation. They'll also reveal the fiercest challenges executives will have to solve. Over to you, Carter. Hello, everyone. My name is Carter Johnson, and I cover banking and fintechs here at Insider. I'm joined today by two of the people leading transformational change in digital banking, Michael Tang of Deloitte and David Tyree of Bank of America. By now, a year into the pandemic, the numbers speak for themselves. 89% of banking customers now use some form of mobile banking tools. And it's not just Gen Z and millennials. That includes 79% of baby boomers like my parents, who are very active mobile banking users. Mobile banking features are now the second most important factor for customers choosing a bank. The only one more important are fees. This is from a recent insider study. Proximity to bank branches is now ranked fifth. And yet one thing remains more important than ever before. The same study said that security was ranked as the most in-demand mobile banking feature. We've all seen the news about data breaches across tech companies, and financial firms. In 2021 and into the future, mobile banking is not a nice to have, it's simply a must have. And competition for digital customers is as fierce as it's ever been before. Michael, you've mentioned during our pre-interview the burning needs dominating the conversation around digital at banks. I'd like to ask you, how have those needs been accelerated since the onset of the pandemic? Thanks, Carter. I was mentioning it's kind of unfortunate um, that it took a global pandemic to change some of the burning desires into a burning platform to really move towards digital channels. But if there's a silver lining at all, even in one of the most regulated industries such as financial services, organization has absolutely proved that they can actually move at great pace velocity and agility to meet these customers' demand. And as you know, everything from contact centers to mid-office and back office has really, really sped up because of the pandemic. And I think one of the great things coming out of this is it not only served that as a catalyst, but this is much more than just the front end of designing in terms of digital transformation or digitization. It replicates right through the mid office and credit risk modeling all the way to the back office and core banking. And I actually think this is a, a great news story where it's going to continue to accelerate the transformation into the digital space. And I think you raise a great point there. And that's something I wanted to ask you, David, is you're, of course, head of digital banking across Bank of America, not just on the consumer side. And so I'd be curious to hear about some of the ways in which you're maybe applying some of the things you're learning in consumer digital to other areas of the bank, maybe on the corporate side or on the investment banking side. Sure, be happy to. First, uh, thanks for having me here today, and uh, thanks for letting me share the floor with Michael. I'm a huge reader of Michael's work, and uh, you know, it's just nice to be able to have uh, an opportunity to have interactions uh, with the two of you guys. So, you know, one thing before I go in and answer that particular question, you know, Michael really brought up an important point, which is the pandemic and the acceleration that's been going on. You know, we saw an acceleration in really three different areas. One was adoption of digital. Two was people seeking advice 
in the digital channel. And really three was the amount of new relationships that we garnered through our digital channels. Obviously the pandemic for, you know, all the reasons we always talk about, you know, drove those things. But if you think about it, you know, we bring on about a million new net digitally active users every year. In this year, we brought in a million in the first quarter. So you see this pent up amount that's that's going through and you get adoption. And like you said, Carter, at the very onset, it's of all age cohorts. The, actually, the fastest growing cohort for our digital adoption is the 65 plus category. So that was one that took us a lot of time to kind of get going on that front. You know, when you think about the advice you know, uh, people are actually coming in because of the uncertainty that's out there and looking for reassurance, looking for advice and guidance. And uh, that's been a big focus area uh, for our customer base. And then the last one is really this notion of new relationships. Pre-pandemic, we were at about 25 to almost 30 percent of all of our new customer acquisition was coming through digital. We're now at 50 percent. Um, so it's really kind of accelerated across the board. And to tie it back to your original question, when you think about digital across the entire Bank of America enterprise, the least common denominator is actually an end customer, one single end customer, whether you know it's somebody in the consumer bank or actually it's a CFO and we're providing tools and capability for on a commercial banking side of things. They have the same same needs. It's the same common ground. They're looking for ease, convenience, safety. They're looking for things to be relevant and timely, and they're looking for uh, a partner. It just happens to be through the digital means. So we're taking the same building blocks that we built that got us to about 52 million digital users in the consumer bank, and now starting to, as I call it, the uh, consumerization of the commercial banking sector. Got it. And, you know, I think that's a great point about really thinking about the end customer. And to that end, I feel like we're hearing a lot about personalization within digital and within digital banking. David, I'm curious if you'd have any thoughts about, one, what personalization actually means for the user experience, and two, the sort of tech that underpins, again, personalization. And Michael, feel free to follow on after that. Yeah, I'd love to hear Michael's comments on that as well. But we don't really call it personalization here. We call it individualization. And the difference between personalization and individualization is that you can personalize a digital experience for somebody, but if you individualize it, it's actually happening in real time. And so that's what we're building, is we're building a platform that is based on individualization. So when Michael logs into the Bank of America app, um, it is actually assembling itself real time to provide him the most relevant and timely information to be able to give him choices of next best step and to really pull together the content that's most important. You know, we believe that the days of having a, a mobile or an, an, an online experience that is click here, then click here, then click here. Uh, those are going away really, really fast. It is come in and it assembles its own. We've done a couple things at Bank of America. And these are more long-term bets that we started a while ago. One is we have one platform for all mobile customers that we're migrating towards. So that means that if you're a Bank of America customer or a Merrill Lynch customer or a small business customer, you actually go into one app and it assembles itself. Obvious benefits to that because you're building once and you're being able to then deploy it amongst multiple lines of business rather than building a Merrill Lynch mobile application and a private bank application, a small business application across the board. So this notion, as you called it, personalization allows us to gain massive efficiencies, but also allows us to really drive a whole new level of customer experience and you know, really expectations. It really becomes a trusted place for our customers. Oh, I love that. Like hyper-personalization is so 2020. The 2021 term is individualization now. I really like yep. that. And I think the cornerstone of this is obviously data, not just customer data, not just proprietary data within your organization, but how do you combine and syndicate it with other sources of data internally or externally to provide that individual experience? And Carter, you mentioned the mobile app, right? That's only one channel. If you do this across the enterprise, as you know, there's multiple channels, whether they're digital, branch is still alive and well, and I think in the future, the notion of embedded banking will be very, very big. Therefore, you know, the first part of it is to show the data around individualization. We're right in that era of 
providing advice, which is through analytics and in some instances, AI and machine learning. I think for the purposes and the theme of this discussion in the future, what's going to be disruptive between embedded banking and just do it for me. So you move from show me, help me to just do it for me. And that's where that customer experience is really going to kick to the next level. That's individual to each and every customer. And, you know, as you say, Michael, this all comes down to data and data is obviously a very expansive term. And we're talking about big data and a lot of data. And I mentioned at the top, you know, the importance of particularly uh, from the retail perspective, people are worried about their data and people are worried about what happens with their data and the uses for it. And so I'd be curious, uh, Michael, maybe if you could first talk about how you think about the nature between data, a retail customer, and the trust they're putting into their financial institution. Yeah, I think a couple um, lenses or dimensions. I think, number one, the regulations of data is still somewhat inconsistent. So the promise of global harmonization is not quite there yet. And I, I know the, the audience might predominantly be in North America right now, but if you look at the EU and all those legislations and regulations apply globally, something such as GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, it's really trying to protect the privacy of customer data. But at the same time, the EU has open banking, which encourages sharing of data. And it's up to both the customer consent and the incumbents to go figure out what that right balance is. And when you marry that with the ambitions of whether it's individualization or personalization, you always have to balance that cool versus creepy aspect. As a consumer, it could be really good and reduce the friction of doing things for me. But at the same time, Carter, to your point is, wow, where did they find that data? That's a little creepy. So I think it's going to be a constant balance between regulators and the amount of data and how you actually use that data. Got it. Understand. And, you know, David, kind of to that point as well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's something like 66 million unique experiences, 66 million touch points at, at Bank of America. And I'm curious how you think about the conversation around data and customer data and what that means kind of sitting here in, in the U.S. You know, that's exactly why I love reading Michael's stuff, because he just nailed it to a T on, you know, this whole notion of data and the the other side to what Michael said, just to build on it a little bit, is the experience the customer gets, the feeling a customer gets when you use the data right or when you do the data wrong. And that's one of the biggest drivers out there, Carter, is to keep a very close eye on that because it has to be relevant and timely. If you come into the Bank of America site and you're looking to do something, I should be using that data, both internal data, as well as what Michael said, outside data, to be able to say, here's something that's relevant and timely for you. And if you get that wrong, the experience is no good. So it's a tightrope that you walk. Now, one thing that we have also been thinking about and deploying over the last six months or so is actually using data that is captured based on customer input. So we have something called a life plan. And it essentially asks, what's important to you? And Michael might be on and say, well, it's family and it's home that's important to you. We're actually capturing that data, not rear view looking data, but what Michael really is, what's important to him. And we're actually combining that into the digital experience. So data is not only outside data, looking in the review mirror, transaction-based data, looking in the mirror, you got to incorporate forward-looking aspirational data. And, you know, we've got about three and a half million people who have used LifePlan. Our SAT scores across the bank and digital are in the, you know, 83, 84 range. For those people who are using LifePlan and we're leveraging that aspirational data, it's 96% client SAT. So there's, there's some real learnings that are there. So to back to your question, yes, we have 66 million uh, customers here, and our job is to make them feel at the end of the day that the experience was in their best interest. So it's everything that you and Michael just said. It's a combination of leveraging the data, applying intelligence to the data, targeting your customers based on their need, not based on what you wanna sell them, 
and then designing an experience that actually has some feeling to it in the form of kind of the EQ side. So it's a balance of IQ and EQ on that side. It's hard to do, really hard to do. If you think of all the things that Michael just said, that's really hard to execute against. But the, I think it's worth focusing on and attending because those who can do it well are going to be the big winners in the future. Got it. And, you know, again, I feel like so much of what we're talking about is about scale and about uh, the breadth of customers that is reached with a lot of the technologies we're talking about. And I'd love to hear, David, if you want to start first, but, you know, how you think about the importance of scale when it comes to digital banking. And, um, you know, kind of a follow on to that is, you know, we've heard some interesting CEO comments from some other banks about fintechs and the threat fintechs play to some of the nation's largest banks. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on fintechs and whether Bank of America kind of approaches them from a partnership perspective or from maybe a more adversarial relationship, given what they're trying to do in the industry. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I'll set the record straight from our standpoint. Any firm that plays in the, the industry of financial services has our respect. Michael said it at the onset most regulated industry out there maybe, you know, or at least one of them. Massively complex, the risks are so great. You know, when you start talking about sizes of customer bases like Bank of America at 66 million, the scope is enormous on all those things. Well, everybody who plays in financial services has our respect. Every player, it doesn't matter if they're a FinTech who started up three days ago, or they're one of the big bank competitors, we have a team who watches them each and every day, every single day, to make sure that we understand what is, what is it our competitors are doing, where are they successful, where have they made missteps, and we learn from that. So just like we learn from every customer interaction, what our customers like and what they don't like, and how we use that to prioritize what goes into our tech planning and what goes into our release schedule, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we use the same kind of external data around our competition on it. Um, you know, the fintechs have done a phenomenal job of finding pain points within the system and addressing those pain points. The challenge that the fintechs had, I think you, you allude to, which is, can they get scale? You know, can they take something like a pain point in onboarding for a checking account and turn that into a solution for customers that includes lending, investing, borrowing, you know, the full spectrum of solutions? Because we do know that customers really value a one-stop shop solution that they can do their whole planning for their financial lives and have a partner on that side. So we watch them each and every day. Scale plays uh, an important part because... Uh, we have momentum, and when we get things right, we get it right in a big way. You know, for example, uh, when we launched Life Plan uh, that I was telling you about earlier, we launched it in October, and I had forecasted that we would bring in 500,000 new customers by the end of the quarter. I blew it, blew it big time. We brought in 2.5 million, <laughs> right? And that's because it was really good, and it worked, and it and it scaled out uh, on that side of things. So that's good. We've tried to adapt really fast. Um, you know, three years ago, we were doing tech releases once a quarter, and they were relatively large. And when you do large tech releases, you get a lot of that, who, where, who moved my cheese with customers saying, you change this, you change that. We decided to switch gears on that. We now do a, a tech release every 28 to 32 days, and we will put in 2,000 plus feature enhancements to our digital properties every single year. So we're able to move much quicker uh, than we ever have before because, you know, there are a lot of players out there who can move quickly. So. Got it. And Michael, I'd love it. Yeah. Jump in. <laughs> yeah. I would echo like, you know, with scale comes a lot of like power. I mean, what I mean by that is you get the efficiencies of scale and from a customer base, there is a degree of trust and loyalty and the feeling of safeness when you have that type of scale. I think if anything, the fintechs have learned that it's extremely difficult and costly to acquire customer bases of 66 million consistently. So they've learned to figure out how to partner with incumbents. I also believe what we can learn from fintechs is the notion of assembling products and services of the future, not just building them. It doesn't necessarily need to be in-house. It could be external with ecosystems, but with today's technology and usage of APIs, 
I believe to get that velocity coupled with scale, you're assembling things in a much more modular fashion. And if something changes, whether it's customer demand, regulations, a new competition comes into play, new technology, they're like Lego blocks where you can resize and reshift things. And although fintechs obviously have innovated and disrupted financial services, I'd probably be also be fearful at looking outside of the industry. I believe industry lines are blurring. So as a customer, although we have this traditional taxonomy of financial services, technology, or telcos, autonomous driving manufacturers have more driver data than insurance companies. And insurance companies use traditional actuaries with risk modeling pools Companies have autonomous cars, have petabytes of data in individualized manner to underwrite insurance policies, way more accurate than risk pooling. I recently spoke with a telco in Southeast Asia where out of a thousand attributes of phone usage, they just don't have, because they're unbanked, the financial health to risk score them. They have figured out through AI and machine learning how an individual charges their phone, when, and at what battery level is the best indicator of loan loss and credit risk. So, you know, between technologies and especially outside of financial services, if we're, the theme is about the future, I wouldn't just look at fintechs, I'd look outside of our industry of how we're gonna be disrupted. Michael brings up a really good point on the scale and looking outside. And and I think, it, you know, if you're a good business person in general, you're gonna look at not only your direct competitors, but potential future competitors. And as Michael indicates outside this to kind of get some lessons learned and, you know, data is an important one uh, for that. So, you know, Michael also brought up the scale and when you get it right, I'll give you a couple examples here. You know, we've got so much data, not nearly as much as what example Carter just gave, but we've got so much data here that we couldn't possibly sort through it on a manual basis. And that was part of the genesis of our, you know, AI solution, Erica. And yes, Erica interfaces with our customers on the engagement, but we use that same engine to help us drive engagement of new features that we put out. So I'll give you an example, Zelle. Right, lots of banks using Zelle that's out there. We have 14 million people actively using Zelle, right? And our ramp up was extreme. And how did we do that? Was we went in there and we leveraged our AI capabilities to be able to say, oh, look, you know, Carter keeps on writing these checks. Next time he comes into the property, introduce Zelle to him, right? Simple things like that. Right. And quick stat for you of the 14 million customers uh, who use Zelle, 75 percent no longer write any checks with Bank of America. Right. That's a big save on that side. And, you know, again, building off what Michael said, we look at the data and we come up with stats like Michael did that help us drive the engagement as well. So, for example, we have a stat that for a new customer coming on board at Bank of America, if you can get them to engage in two digital features, just make it up, Zelle and mobile check deposit, any two, 97% chance that after a year, they're gonna remain digitally active. So get them to try it early and you go from there. So you take a stat like that and you put it in the hands of our 25,000 customer facing associates that are in our financial centers or the associates that are on our phones and you, would you like fries with that order approach, which is you get them to try a couple things. And next thing you know, your digital engagement activity is through the roof. Yeah, I have a friend at Google that uses this term quite often. Data and facts will trump people's opinions and points of views. <laughs> sure. And I'm just going to jump in here because we've covered a lot of ground in just over 20 minutes. And I think we you know, are just about to wrap up. But I think one final word just to think about, uh, David, if you want to go first, and then Michael, when we think about the future of, of digital banking and continuing the momentum that we've seen during the pandemic, I'd love if you could just describe in a sentence or two how we continue that momentum, how you keep it going, even as the world somewhat returns back to back to normal, so to speak. So I guess it's three different words that I'd use, Carter, to summarize that, you know, or 
you know, three different points. The first point is you got to be true to what customers need, want, and desire. Basic building block of banking, make it easy, convenient, and safe for me. So that's priority number one on that side. The second piece of this kind of alludes back to what Michael was saying, which is you can make it easy, you can make it safe, you can make it convenient, but you also have to make it omni-channel. This is not about a mobile app. This is not about a you know, online service, it all has to work together. And that's one of the biggest focus points for us is making sure that it all works together because you can do an awful lot in the digital space, pretty much anything other than taking cash, right? I can't take cash out of my mobile piece of things. But inevitably, if you have a lifelong relationship with a customer, there's gonna come a point in time where they need real advice and they're gonna wanna sit down face to face. So I don't fundamentally believe there's ever a, 100% digital only solution. There's always gonna be this high tech, high touch. So that's kind of the build I would build off of what Michael said. And then the last part is the stakes of the game have been risen because it's all about, as I said, individualization, which is, can I make this personal to you? That's the winning formula. Final word, Michael? Yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball (laughs) because then I could predict uh, what Dogecoin is gonna be trading at next week. But I think fundamentally, You know, through this wave, the pandemic, in terms of taxonomy, I believe there's a difference between digitization and digital transformation. What we see a lot of is leveraging the technologies, the business process to make things easier, reduce friction, increase efficiency. But by and large, many organizations are still running the similar operating models, business models, and making money the same way. The revenue pools and profit pools are generally calculated the same way. Transformation is breaking that all apart and with disruption, really figuring out what are those new operating models? What are those new innovative products and services to offer and potentially augmenting and finding new revenue streams? And I think with all the building blocks with technology, what we're learning through at the velocity that we can change, um, transformation is really what the future is going to be about in the industry. All right. Thank you all so much for attending. And a big thank you to Michael Tang and David Tyree for this really thoughtful conversation. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Carter. Thanks, Carter. And thanks so much to Michael and David for sharing these insights on digital transformation. Up next, cryptocurrencies are perhaps one of the biggest financial innovations in recent memory. They've been absolutely dominating headlines in the past few weeks. Bianca Chan, reporter here at Insider, is here with execs from some of the biggest names in crypto right now. Over to you, Bianca. Thanks, Meredith, and welcome, everyone. Cryptocurrency has once again become a trending topic. To discuss the incredible run digital currency has had recently and what to expect moving forward, I'm joined by Michael Sonnenschein, CEO of Grayscale Investments, and Lauren Abenschein, head of U.S. institutional coverage at Coinbase. Before we get into it, I wanted to give each of you uh, a chance to introduce yourselves and your respective companies. Lauren, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. And thanks for having me today. Coinbase is the first choice for sophisticated institutions and investors who want to start investing in digital assets. Coinbase has the most complete and robust suite of services for institutional investors, offering the trust, security, and performance needed by investors to trade and store digital assets with confidence. And with our recent prime offering announcement, we're doubling down on our commitment to serving the growing institutional market. So that's our focus here at Coinbase Institutional. Great to be here. I'm Michael Sonnenschein. I'm CEO of Grayscale Investments. Uh, We are the world's largest digital currency asset management business. Dating back to 2013, we've now developed a family of 14 different investment products that are really focused on providing access to both retail and institutional investors uh, to gain exposure to digital currencies. Uh, Today, we manage right around $40 billion, um, and we are right here in the New York area. Crypto enjoyed a hectic run in 2017, but what occurred in late 2020 and early 2021 massively dwarfed that. Michael, tell me what happened these past 12 months. 
I think what we're seeing now is a market that is much healthier and much more two-sided than we've ever seen before. And the dynamics at play in the crypto market today are very different than they were in the 2017 run-up. We've really seen the development of derivatives, lending and borrowing, uh, the development of order management systems, indices, further regulatory clarity around the asset class. And what's really propelled, I think, a lot of the investment has been a real change around the narrative and general acceptance that crypto is not going to go away. And when you combine the resiliency that this asset class has demonstrated over even just the last 12 to 18 months, for investors, they're eager to deploy capital because crypto can provide them with a differentiated return stream. They're now seeing that there is no more stigma or any career risk associated with getting involved in crypto. They're seeing notable experienced investors getting involved in the ecosystem. And as you shared, they're also seeing really strong participation from both startup and legacy financial institutions that are both offering crypto products and services, or in some instances, even adding crypto to their balance sheets. And so I think for us and from our view of the world, it's just an entirely different landscape and a maturation that we're really excited and encouraged by. Yeah, thank you. And to that point, Lauren, what lessons learned have you deployed in the past year to not overextend yourself, you know, in case there was a market pullback? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like all asset classes, crypto markets will rise and fall over time. And you know, we take a long term view and have been doing that for the entirety of our eight plus year history here at Coinbase. And you have to remember that it's early days for crypto and for building what we call the crypto economy. We now have a proliferation of use cases for crypto involving stable coins, reward tokens, governance tokens, and smart contracts. So ultimately, we see sophisticated investors for whom we facilitate trading, custody, and lending activity, recognizing that engagement in this space is more than just about short-term price action. And we find that really encouraging. So there's been a lot of talk of what it will take for more Wall Street adoption of cryptocurrency for years. From where you stand now, where are the biggest hangups? Well, I think some of the comments I shared about some of the tools that have been developed are really powerful um, and have really accelerated adoption from Wall Street and the investment community as a whole. The barriers to entry for crypto, whether investors are choosing to invest through Grayscale products, partnering with a company like Coinbase or countless others, there are more avenues than ever to get involved. I think what we're seeing, though, is as robust and as powerful as the tools being built around crypto are, whether, again, it's order management tools, APIs, tax lot reporting, various um, things that investors are used to seeing around other assets, be it equities or fixed income. The interesting piece is that it hasn't yet been bridged into the legacy financial system. And so investors are still not accessing crypto the same way they would a stock, a bond, an ETF, commodity commodities, etc. And I think both the work that we're doing here at Grayscale, the work that Coinbase and others are doing is really, really important because when you do start to see those bridges um, being built between crypto and the legacy system, you would certainly see uh, what we believe to be a massive influx of new investors um, as crypto becomes easier and easier to access, not to mention a lot more capital being able to flow into the ecosystem. And what about you, Lauren? What are you seeing as the, the biggest roadblocks there? Yeah, I strongly agree with Michael's comments here. You know, and historically, we've seen three key barriers that have been hangups, things like regulatory uncertainty, costing trading lending infrastructure, the sort of bridges that Michael was referring to, and also investor perception. And I think we can really point to meaningful changes in each of these areas. We see increased regulatory engagement, the launch of landmark products like Coinbase Prime and others in the ecosystem, and then leading active managers getting involved who are trusted by their LPs. I think underlying all of this is simply creating that trust as well through the proliferation of strong institutional products. And I think this is where having incumbents like Coinbase and Grayscale who have you know, performed over you know, extended periods really help to bring adoption from Wall Street. And Lauren, I would just add to that, you know, on your first point about regulatory clarity, if we were having this conversation with Bianca, maybe even two or two and a half years ago, 
you'd actually ask us and we tell you that oftentimes investors were citing regulatory uncertainty as a reason that would prevent them from investing in crypto, despite their investment conviction and desire to have that exposure. And I'd say today, the fact that we've seen regulatory clarity, certainly here in the US out of the SEC, the CFTC, the IRS, FinCEN, Treasury, you know, regulatory uncertainty is no longer an issue for investors. Certainly in other parts of the world, we are still seeing both prohibitive and permissive policies being made around crypto. But to Lauren's point, it's still early days and a lot of that still will be unfolded over time. So Bitcoin ETFs have been mulled for a while by the SEC, and but approval has yet to come. Michael, you've submitted your own proposal for one. What seems to be the biggest hang up as far as, you know, a Bitcoin ETF? This is something that uh, my team has been committed to uh, since 2016. Our flagship fund, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, with trades under the symbol GBTC, we first started our dialogue with the SEC in 2016 to turn it into a bona fide ETF on a national securities exchange. And ultimately, we pulled out of that process in 2017, realizing that regulators were just not yet ready for it. And some of the issues that regulators have cited around the crypto ecosystem are things like surveillance sharing. You know, these are the types of protections and monitoring that are in place for equities and other assets. And we just don't yet have that level of infrastructure around crypto markets um, and crypto order books and exchanges. I think they're also looking for a more robust and significant regulated market. And so I definitely think the, the proliferation of the derivative space, the fact that we have futures now around Bitcoin and others um, is really, really powerful. And while I would say from our seats that we're certainly encouraged by the maturation of the ecosystem as a whole, you know, we're not yet seeing a level of maturation that I think has yet satisfied regulators. And so they remain very, very engaged with folks like Grayscale um, and others in the community in an asset class that is obviously rapidly, rapidly changing. And so I'd, I'd leave you with the Bitcoin ETF is not only something that we at Grayscale are committed to, but I think is something that is really going to be a matter of when and not so much a matter of if. Yeah, I mean, let's back this up a bit. How crucial even is a Bitcoin ETF to Wall Street adoption? Could the latter occur without the former? I mean, I think an important takeaway, just looking at the success and growth of businesses like Grayscale and Coinbase, should really signal to folks that investors are not waiting to access crypto or add crypto to their portfolios. Uh, for an ETF to come onto the scene. Our asset growth has been explosive, um, as has it been at Coinbase and other, other you know, access points for investors. And so I do think, though, based on some of the types of surveys our team conducts and looking at the financial advisor community and the investment community as a whole, there is certainly a subset of investors that do want to access crypto through an ETF. But the important takeaway is that investors aren't necessarily as a majority waiting for an ETF before they first add crypto to their investment allocations. I think that's a I think that's a great call out. I mean, you know, Coinbase today has one hundred and twenty two billion dollars in assets on the platform and crypto, you know, just from institutions alone. And I think that's a really strong indicator of the fact that the, the Bitcoin ETF is not the single holdup. Um, for institutions to get involved, or for individuals for that matter. I would reflect your comments that we really are seeing widespread adoption of cryptocurrencies, and it's happened faster than I think you know many would have expected. When you see leading lights like Paul Tudor Jones, Ray Dalio, Bill Miller you know, coming into the space, I think these are really you know, important indicators of the seriousness with which leading investors um, you know, are taking this, this space uh, and their, their willingness to get involved. And so transparency into spot exchanges is a topic often brought up when discussing the Bitcoin ETF and, you know, whether that's fixable. Lauren, how does Coinbase approach this? Absolutely. Well, Coinbase's exchange uh, is a market subject to various money transmitter requirements, robust AML and KYC regulations, along with our bit license. And we really thought a lot about you know, market surveillance as a rigorous program on par with regulated exchanges globally. And we even go above and beyond uh, what reg regulators require in several circumstances, which is very much around our philosophy of focus on robust uh, and rigorous you know, uh, processes. And specifically in regards to you know, our employees and asset issuer activity as an example of ways in which we go above and beyond. 
Uh, our strong trade surveillance program enabled us to detect manipulative, fraudulent trading on the platform and to effectively eliminate bad actors, creating a safe environment for our customers to trade in. So this is a really key set of tenants with which we run our own exchange. And we think it's an important way in which we're a participant in this ecosystem. And then there's the issue of sustainability with Bitcoin. Lauren, I know Coinbase has done some research in this space. What are the major takeaways from your recent report? So we covered five myths about Bitcoin's energy consumption. Obviously, this is a complex topic and uh, investors will want to do a lot of their own work uh, to understand this topic. You know, one myth we highlighted is that the idea is that miners don't use green energy. And actually, Bitcoin is greener than many people realize. To stay competitive, Bitcoin miners have to seek out abundant and inexpensive forms of energy, meaning that there's no energy source more abundant and affordable than green energy. So we think that's an important thing to consider. Also, the problem of energy consumption is cited as the primary issue here. The real problem is CO2 and not energy consumption. Bitcoin could actually help drive demand for more renewable energy. So we'd encourage people to take a look at some of the myths that we've highlighted here and the ways in which uh, additional considerations might be brought to this issue. The whole topic of sustainability with mining, I mean, will that prevent investment managers with ESG mandates from getting involved? What do you think, Michael? I actually don't think that that's a concern. I think we've certainly seen folks want to move towards uh, ESG and have that be an important um, aspect of their investment decisions. But to Lauren's point, I mean, today we're seeing about 76% of miners using renewables as part of their energy mix. And because it is such a competitive environment, that's a really important aspect um, and a really important driver of a miner's profitability and their operations overall. And so I think it just stands to reason that, you know, 10 or 12 years into the life cycle of this asset, the fact that we are able to focus on things like sustainability and ESG, we're, we're going to use this as an opportunity as an industry to put together new solutions, employ new technologies, because we've seen this ecosystem get challenged no, no fewer than probably 100 times over the course of its life cycle. And uh, I'll certainly be one to say that each time it does get challenged, it certainly emerges from those challenges stronger than ever. So I think from our view of the world, we definitely look at this opportunistically and as a challenge that this industry is ready to take on. I think it's a great point, uh, Michael, as well on the innovation front. You know, this isn't a static space. And so you think about things like you know, concerns about Bitcoin scaling from an energy perspective. You know, Bitcoin's designed to scale because its transaction volume is independent of energy usage. So that it can accommodate more transactions with the same amount of energy. So as we see continued investment in this space, continued focus on issues like scalability, I think we will continue to make really important progress here. Market and pricing volatility have also contributed to headlines in crypto news. If cryptocurrency or when cryptocurrency does achieve mass adoption on Wall Street, how might that change the, the structure of crypto pricing, do you guys think? Well, I, I think any investor who is deploying capital into crypto today um, is certainly doing so, I would say, from the most informed vantage point that we've ever seen. You know, investors are not any longer coming to folks like us or Coinbase with kind of Bitcoin or Ethereum 101 or 201 questions. There's just such an abundance of, of research and, and educational materials out there for them to understand the asset class. And I think part of that is that investors understand that when they do invest in crypto, because it is a nascent asset class, that it is subject to you know, pretty pronounced price movement. I would say to my earlier comments, though, that we are seeing probably the healthiest two-sided market we've ever seen. And investors understand and need to have the risk appetite for an asset that can be exceedingly volatile at times. All that being said, it's important to remember that from our seat, every time we do see one of these pullbacks in price, and it could be driven by news or events or headlines or any number of factors affecting the price of Bitcoin, that we do see investors opportunistically step into those pullbacks because if their conviction in having this allocation hasn't changed, but they could buy the asset cheaper than they could the day before or two days before, then for investors who do have that medium to longer term time horizon, it's a really compelling opportunity for them. I, I would absolutely echo those comments. And I think ultimately the availability, as Michael referenced, of data, of proliferation of information of a, of, a, of a longer and longer history growing by the day 
in this industry, enabling investors to become increasingly informed, to, to develop their own models, uh, and to apply their own uh, risk approach to this asset class is extremely important. And it really means that the ongoing wave of uh, investors moving into this asset class are, as Michael said, better informed than ever and really well positioned uh, to manage volatility and risk. And Bianca, I'd also just add that I think what's interesting about the emergence, particularly of assets like Bitcoin, is really now amongst the investors we talk to, a general acceptance, um, at least for one of its use cases, being as a digital gold or as a digital store of value. And when markets get turbulent um, or there's uncertainty, what's been interesting is that investors now have an additional tool to think about protecting and diversifying their portfolio, whereas Historically, they maybe could go to cash or to bonds or, um, you know, various other instruments. They now also include Bitcoin as part of that um, set of tools they have for portfolio protection. And so, again, that's just one use case that we're seeing that's very um, well received and widely held amongst investors. But we're also excited by, you know, to Lauren's earlier point that we're just on the precipice of starting to see other use cases emerging, not just around Bitcoin, but around the asset class as a whole. Um, so, you know, early days and, and exciting to see how those unfold. Yeah, Lauren, are you seeing the, the same strategy play out uh, in terms of diversification of portfolios? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, you know, when we see sophisticated institutional investors come to Coinbase, they're asking us not just about Bitcoin, but also Ethereum. And, you know, with the explosion of DeFi, you know, we've seen increasing interest in those assets. And what's really encouraging to us is interaction directly with those protocols. And so we are seeing genuine engagement and interest in a wide variety of assets um, across what we call, again, the crypto economy. That to us signals that investors understand that this is more than just a single asset and that it's a you know, set of technologies and a, a set of you know, different value accruing assets. And we think that's really healthy for the space. And in our last few minutes here, a question from the audience. What's your advice for someone who wants to get in on the crypto action? Any words of wisdom to those looking to enter the market this time around? Well, ultimately, I'd say uh, starting out at coinbase.com slash learn, we have a great set of resources just to get to know the crypto basics. And then if you like, you can head over to coinbase.com slash earn to earn crypto while learning about these different assets. Uh, we think quite ultimately the best way to learn is to be hands-on and to get involved in this space. You know, crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, the asset class as a whole, um, for a lot of folks, represents a pretty meaningful departure uh, from some of the assets that they're typically used to investing in. And so I think that, you know, not only is education an opportunity, to Lauren's point, but I also think just actually directly getting involved. So whether you, you know, go and you buy a couple shares of GBTC in your brokerage account or retirement account, or you go and you buy $5 worth of Bitcoin on Coinbase, you know, having that kind of tangible first experience um, in the ecosystem, I think can be really important and help to demystify for a lot of people what they may perceive to be really, really difficult to access. And in fact, what we continue to see is really the proliferation of you know, on ramps that make it really, really accessible for investors to add crypto to their portfolios. And all that being said, it's also important, and I'd be remiss not to share, that as excited as Lauren and I are by the ecosystem, crypto is not for everyone. Um, we generally tend to see crypto investors be those with higher risk tolerances, having longer, you know, time horizons for their investments. Um, and that's not going to be for everyone. So that's an important consideration to keep in mind as well. So what's next for cryptocurrency? That is the multi-trillion dollar question, and our guests have been so strong in giving their insights into this topic. It's still early days, as we've been mentioning, for digital currency, with a global market cap of roughly two trillion, depending on the day. But that size should only highlight two things. First, its potential for growth, and the factors stunting that growth, like potentially the lack of a Bitcoin ETF, opaqueness into trading venues for crypto and the scrutiny around its environmental impact. These will be key factors to watch as Wall Street mulls whether crypto is worth the risk. Thank you so much for joining today's session and thank you to our speakers, Michael and Lauren, for being leaders in the field and for all of the insights today. Back to my colleague Meredith in the studio. Thanks, Bianca, Michael and Lauren. 
for taking us beyond the headlines and explaining what's really going on with crypto. Reminder, we have an official hashtag, Future of Finance, that you can use to discuss today's conversations. You can also check out our survey at any time during the event. Now, to our next panel, Insider reporter Shannon Below will give us a sneak peek at the next stages of innovation and in how we shop and pay. She'll talk with two execs who will explain why your wallet is a key battleground for the future of finance. Over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Meredith. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Shannon Ballow and I'm a reporter here at Insider. We're here today to talk about payments, a rapidly changing and increasingly important part of the financial world. From contactless payments to mobile wallets to QR codes, the way consumers pay and get paid has become increasingly digital as our lives have shifted online. Businesses too are embracing digital ways to move money as the lines between in-store and online have blurred. To discuss what's changed and what comes next in the world of digital payments, I'm thrilled to welcome our two panelists, First, we have Leah Chow, Head of Wholesale Payment Solutions at J.P. Morgan Chase. We also have Matt Sayoka, VP and Head of Global Strategy, Partnerships and Enablement at Amex Digital Labs. So I'd like to start on the consumer side of things. Matt, can you talk to us about how consumers' expectations for digital payments have changed and where you're seeing merchants adjust to meet those expectations? Probably pretty obvious for most people that um, the pandemic has only fueled the use of digital payments across a lot of different customer segments. Before we were seeing certain behaviors using mobile wallets and phones to pay for things or peer-to-peer -peer payments that were somewhat more isolated to certain user groups, now they've become just more and more predominant as people don't like to touch terminals and they don't wanna to touch cash. So I really feel like the pandemic has fueled a lot of some of those underlying behaviors that we had seen in the past. You know, in particular, even the other day, my 91-year-old grandmother sent me a peer-to-peer -peer payment instead of giving me cash which was, you know, in my mind, just a representation of how far things are moving. You mentioned your grandma, and I've, I've heard that quite a bit, right? People of all age groups embracing digital payments. And, you know, how sticky do you think these new habits are going to be? Yeah, absolutely. You know, to be honest, a lot of the form factors we're seeing have been around for many years. NFC contactless payments continue to be really important. In the past, we saw very regional uh, differences. So in Europe, NFC was very popular at first. It wasn't as popular in the US several years ago. That's really changed in the last few years as more and more consumers are paying with phones and contactless cards. In Asia, you know, in mainland China, QR codes are the most popular form factor that have been used. We've started seeing more QR codes pop up in other parts of the world. We in fact have a version of an Amex Pay mobile wallet that's live in Singapore that uses QR codes so customers can pay at hawker stands and other, other merchant locations. And in the US, I don't know about you, but I've seen, you know, living in San Francisco, restaurants using QR codes to show you a food menu. Sometimes payments are included with that. So a lot of those older technologies are actually kind of seeing new life and new innovation. One observation that I've had, though, is, you know, these form factors don't always scale on their own. And often just adding a new form factor, even if it's digital, if it doesn't solve a broader need for the ecosystem or for the various constituents, it can be really difficult to scale. So, you know, like I mentioned, QR codes have been in the US for a while. We've not seen them hit, you know, the same level of scale and adoption. It really just is another example that we will probably continue to see some of those geographic variances and that you really need to make sure the new form factor innovation really does something meaningful for the broader ecosystem in order to, for it to be adopted. So in thinking about the US, obviously we recognize QR codes are kind of starting to happen, but there's like a lot of interest in mobile wallets, contactless cards, et cetera, um, which do you think will sort of stay on longer or have more adoption going into later this year? I think in the US in particular, we've seen a lot of fra fragmentation and usage of form factors, and I expect that to continue. So in some instances, you might want to use a physical card. In other you know, digital experiences, you might have a credit card saved on file, and you don't actually really need a form factor. You just go about the user experience, and when you're ready to transact, the payment's sitting there ready to go. So I expect that the fragmentation will likely continue. I do think that many of the behaviors that were adopted during the pandemic are likely to you know, continue on with a lot of those customer segments. Part of it is the behaviors can just tend to stick over time once you've done them a few times. And in other instances, 
a consumer might have realized, wow, it actually is convenient or it is beneficial for me to send this peer to peer payment instead of carrying cash in my wallet. I think on the whole, we're likely to see continued adoption as the norm. Leah, I'd like to shift gears and talk a little more about the business side of things. We've seen a ton of accelerated change on, on the consumer payments experience, but where are we with businesses and what are the major themes you're looking at from your perspective leading corporate payments? On the wholesale side, I see the similar trends that Matt talked about, right? The consumerization of wholesale industries and the conversions of those industries. Right? I think, you know, take direct to consumer, for example, right? Especially uh, via e-commerce. That was a major pivot that many companies made last year out of necessity. And then you look at now, many companies are looking to make those pivots a permanent right in 2021 and beyond. And they're really looking at that model to drive their, their business growth, to acquire new customers, to offer new experiences. And also direct to consumer can take on many different forms, right? It could be subscription model, right? That reoccur reoccurring uh, revenue model. It could be a marketplace model, right? Where an ecosystem uh, will bring together the consumers and, and sellers uh, together. So I think um, all these, we've seen corporate clients adopting and growing these uh, new business models um, quite rapidly. Take subscription model, for example, right? We, you know, that's not a, a new model. We know that Netflix has really uh, grown uh, on the back of that. But I think what's, uh, what's really surprising is the, the, the pace of adoption. Right, you think about Disney Plus, uh, it got to 100 million subscribers in, in 16 months, right? And, and it took Netflix 10 years to get there. So I think that's just really obvious that there is an acceleration of digital payments, of new forms of direct to consumer type of payments. And the implications on the corporate side is just, I think, is very substantial, right? A lot of the B2B companies, they never had to really think about how to accept consumer payments, right? What kind of forms of payments that Matt talked about, all the wallets and whatnot, they didn't use to have to think about that. Now they do. And now payments become such an important client experience lever uh, that can really power their growth. So I think it's quite an exciting time to see the transformation across the multiple industries. Um, there's also examples where technology that may have you know, been adopted at scale on the consumer side that on the corporate side, we're seeing new use cases and new innovations coming out of that. We have a great product, for example, called American Express Go. It's essentially a version of tokenization where you tokenize a card credential, but we've used it in this commercial instance where you can issue this sort of short-term virtual account, you can give it to a user such as someone who's recruiting for a job at your company, and it just it makes it easier because the user can add it to their favorite mobile wallet as they're paying during their recruiting trip, and then expense and reconciliation is easier for the corporate card customer on the on that back end side of things. So there's a lot of great examples like that where these new use cases that you know didn't exist before are coming to fruition. Absolutely, I'm curious how from an organizational perspective, the thought processes and prioritization of payments has changed? That's a great question because that's the biggest change I see, right, across a wide range of corporates. There's always the, those perennial needs of really making payments more efficient, reducing the cost of payments, optimizing, right, how we, how corporate treasury manage cash, right, working capital, how do we minimize the trapped cash? I think those continue to exist. Uh, but as more and more corporates look for payments to really drive growth, we see um, payments playing a very versatile role, right, in terms of as a revenue driver, right? The new business models look for payments to drive their, their growth. We talked about subscription models. Uh, you think about connected cars, right? All the payments are embedded in that, in that connected device. And I see other companies also using payments in the financing solution as a as a you know tool to advance their diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. Right, they can you know tier the different financing rates and payment speed to their suppliers who are minority owned or women owned. So I think you know it's just payments become a very very powerful tool uh, in terms of customer experience, in terms of advancing the corporate growth agenda, and also their um, their other mission, right? Either diversity, inclusion, or their ESG type of goals. That's a really interesting point. Matt, I'm curious, you know, I guess same question to you. Amex obviously is a payments company, but also you work with other people. What have you seen in terms of companies' perspectives around payments, even, you know, in the tech world? I think payments become an enabler for a broader set of experiences. So um, I think what's changing now and embedded payments was referenced earlier is just this notion that you can create this proliferation of experiences and payments really doesn't have to be such a, an isolated moment. It can really be built into whatever channel or form factor or experience the customer is in. And I think companies and merchants are thinking in a much more expansive way about that and they're providing greater flexibility, whether it's ordering things ahead and then going to pick it up 
or you know, engaging with a digital assistant or a connected smart device. I recently moved into a new home during the pandemic. I was kind of surprised to see how many of the appliances and things were all smart appliances connected to the, to the internet and the cloud. It really just brings up this proliferation of opportunity, to be honest, where you can try to find ways to add convenience for customers based on these digital channels and products where they're already spending their time today. That's why payments is a very powerful kind of almost like revenue driver, right? Because I think I read somewhere, right, the internet, the whole internet economy is now moving away from advertisement to really like payments and financial services, right? Because those experiences are so uh, core to the consumers and to the corporates. And we can, you know, there are a lot of growth opportunities around around that uh, those experiences. It's always something I like to ask people in the payments world, because I remember like back in 2019, having conversations about connected devices and refrigerators that can pay for groceries. And to be honest, it sounded totally far-fetched to me and maybe five years down the line. But, you know, from both of your perspectives, like how close are we to adoption of those kinds of like absolutely behind the scenes money movement. I think it's happening already. I feel like there's a saying that future is already here. It's just in different places, right? And then people feel it at different levels. You take the car, for example. I bet, you know, in the telematics, you already see a lot of the embedded payment functions, right? Either you pay for the entertainment or the smart maps or whatnot. Like all those um, services and payments are already invisible and embedded. Like Uber, right? I, you know, I used Uber yesterday. Um, you, you don't think about payments at all. You just like book a car and, and you step out of the car and you're done. But the payments happen in the background. So I think more and more that's what where the future is, is really moving towards that seamless, invisible, kind of contextual payments, right? And embedded in the social media context. And you know, for example, I think, I don't know if you watch the Amazon show, it's called Making the Cut, like the reality fashion design show, right? Every episode there is, a, at the end, there is a winning outfit. And then there's a little button there and say, shop the look. And you can buy that outfit right there, right? In that context, in that reality show. And then, then you, it leads you to an Amazon store dedicated to the show. I mean, that, that is really how embedded the payments are uh, already today. And so, you know, quite, quite exciting time. I totally agree. I think we're already there. These trends and use cases are already happening. They're maybe not adopted by all segments in all places. So again, they're sort of like an early adopter group and some of these use cases might take a little bit of time to scale. I guess um, maybe to be a little bit controversial, I'll, I'll slightly disagree with Leah in the fact that I think that um, invisible payments can be magical and can be great for certain use cases. So I, I agree that that can be a great experience and we're probably gonna see more and more of those examples. There are, however, other times where you don't want the payment to be invisible. Sometimes you wanna check you know, certain details before you say, yes, take my money and the transaction is complete. So I do think it is use case dependent and kind of channel and circumstance dependent, but it's all about creating a great experience. And depending on what great is defined as, that's how we'll have to kind of version how invisible or front and center the interactions could be. And maybe just to connect back to my earlier commentary on form factor and QR codes, again, the innovation needs to solve a need and actually be a better experience or be a better use case or opportunity. If it's just a form factor switch or if it's great for a consumer but not great for a merchant, it's going to be difficult to scale. So I do think there will sort of, sort of start to be a balance. So when I think about the connected appliances in my house or a connected car, sometimes a card on file saved might be good enough to enable certain types of use cases. Other times, I really might want that newer form factor that's more unique. No, I agree with you, Matt. Absolutely. I think especially in the corporate world, they want to see all the details of a payment. They want that visibility, real-time visibility and information on like what are all the payments being made, right? How much they get charged, what's the fee, what's the FX spread that built into those payments. I think in those cases, then the solution is really that real-time, right, on-demand multi-bank um, solution, like API-driven solution that gives the corporate uh, right treasurer and payments has that level of visibility, the holistic view of their payments, their status, right? They can have the control and, and really think about their cash. Yeah, those are great points. And I guess my question would be going forward, how does this all shake out? Are we going to see more bespoke, customizable solutions? Are consumers going to be able to choose what they do and don't see? And on the wholesale side, right? And it, what we see is, is really there's no one size fits all, right? They are um, corporates, right? Maybe in the more not so digital native um, players. So think of traditional like consumer retail clients, right? Or you know, automakers and whatnot. As they venture into the more direct consumer type of model, 
they would want more support, right? Meaning like they would want a bank or a payments fintech partner, one, right? Really help them think about the end-to-end -end flows and how some of them may even want to outsource, right? The entire process to a provider. And to the other extreme of the digital natives, right? Think of the marketplaces and, and really the native digital players. They want to provide more modular services. I don't, I don't imagine like the largest e-commerce platform would outsource right their payment processing you know the you know value added services but they will look at really what are the modules they want right they may want an api driven solution to plug into their ecosystem they may want to leverage the banks for their core competencies right so i think it's, there's a wide range um and as a bank you know jp morgan we just want to be able to offer those modular value added services really depending on the client needs i agree i think it's hard to kind of generalize i think you have to be prepared to support a, a wide range of use cases. You need to give tools and products and services that merchants and tech companies and other partners can embed you know, where they see fit in the right ways. And we spend a lot of time working together to make sure the security is there and the you know, great customer experience is there from an end-to-end -end standpoint. So you know, in some instances, giving customers more choice and more customization you know, less simple and sometimes simplicity is better. So I do really think it depends on the circumstance and the use case. So we have to build products and services that can support that broad range in the ecosystem. Just looking forward, um, given all the change that we've seen over the last 18 months or so, what are, you know, the more nascent, more in the works kinds of payments things that you're seeing? Um, what do you expect to shine uh, through the end of this year? I would say for us at JP Morgan, there are two things uh, we're working on at JP Morgan, right? In terms of more thinking about the future. One is we briefly touch upon the Internet of Things, right? The embedded payments. And then we re really think about how we, you know, can offer those, we call it microservices, right? Of payment services to our clients in a very tailored way, which by the way is a huge mindset shift, right? In the past, banks, we, 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 we like to own everything. We like to build everything. Like we like clients to use our banking portals for everything. That's just not the path forward anymore. Right? We're ma building microservices. We're embedding our payment services, banking services, right into those smart devices. We want to, you know, be part of that ecosystem. So I think that's definitely something that we're exploring and investing very um, aggressive on. The other one, I would say, more nascent payment mechanism is really the the next generation payments uh, platform and rails. Right. By that I mean the blockchain driven. Uh, payments platform and uh, JP One Coin as as a form of tokenization to really revolutionize the the cross border right multi currency real time money movement and, and information movement. Certainly, that's in early days, but you know I see tremendous potential. Right, you think about our Link platform, which is our uh, blockchain platform. We already have 400 plus right banks and institutions signed up for it. We we are live with use cases. Right, we connected you know 25 of the Plus of the you know largest 50 banks on the blockchain, so really you know there are real use cases of account validation, for example, right on that blockchain um, to be able to validate consumer and corporate accounts real time globally. So certainly I see that as kind of the next frontier of the art of the possible, right? For for payments are really moving into that global real time distributed manner. Yeah, to build upon that, I completely agree that in the kind of you know somewhat bundled blockchain plus crypto plus digital currency plus central bank digital currencies there's a, a ton of opportunity there we're still in the early innings i believe and i think as an industry um, in financial services there's a lot we're going to have to navigate from a regulatory perspective but also just covering the basics of what would users expect and want but i think there's a lot of potential there so that's something we're certainly actively looking at i also feel like there's kind of much room to improve some of the basic things that we still have in place today. So I mentioned earlier, peer-to-peer -peer payments continues to explode in growth. We recently launched an Amex send and split feature that makes it easier for customers to split transactions and get paid back directly to their American Express cards through a partnership with PayPal and Venmo. So there are some great ways that I think we can still improve upon some behaviors and needs even though we have you know, some starting products and platforms that are already out there. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to keeping an eye out on all of those emerging trends. Uh, Leah, Matt, thank you so much for a really interesting discussion. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And Meredith, we'll kick it back to you. Thanks, Shannon. And a big thank you to Leah and Matt. 
That was a super interesting conversation around payment options and what innovations we might see in the very near future. And now, ESNG. Three letters, but one massive topic for investors around the world. Insider reporter Bradley Sachs will hear from key gatekeepers at two top investing firms about how they're thinking about sustainable finance. Over to you, Bradley. Welcome, everyone. We are currently in a climate crisis. From raging fires to rising seas, all the top scientists agree our current situation is untenable. The response from the financial services industry has been a rapidly growing subsection of the space known as ESG investing. And to talk with us about this space today is two leading investors, Karen Corneal Tambor and John Hepner. Karen is the co-CIO of Sustainable Investments for Bridgewater Associates, the largest hedge fund in the world. And John is the head of US stewardship and sustainable investments for legal and general investment management a manager that manages over $1 trillion in assets. Karen, my first question will go to you. When you think about sustainable investments, what data are you using specifically to find these new and interesting investment ideas? It's a great question because I think that while investors are accustomed almost to the idea that when they regularly invest, there is a huge mess of data. And part of the job of an investor is to find out what's pertinent, sort through all that data uh, and make sense of it. That feels new in the sustainability space. And so there's almost a surprise that so many data sets don't match, give a different picture. But in our view, it's not any different than a question like, what is today's growth rate in China? If you look at it, you're gonna find lots of data, it's going to clash, there can be different perspectives on that question, and you're gonna to have to find a way to handle big data, small data, messy data, clean data, triangulate, what have you. The same thing in the sustainability space. For us, it really starts with the question of what are your goals? In other words, what are you trying to get out of the data? Don't think about what data is presented to you, but what concept are you actually trying to capture? Once you know clearly what the concept is you're trying to capture, what's really fantastic is that the ecosystem of providing data in the sustainability space is getting better and better each day. And so investors calling up data providers saying, this is the concept I'm trying to capture and here is why, is rapidly improving the options available to meet the needs of what investors want. And the other thing is today, there's so many areas of investing where issues to do with social and environmental are just core to what's pertinent to the investment, that even investors who don't think of themselves as I'm working on ESG are finding themselves asking these questions and saying, well, if the thing that policymakers care about is transitioning to a green economy, I have got to understand that. If the thing that policymakers care about is tackling equality, I guess I've got to understand that. And so more and more, you're just getting a response to that uh, in terms of providing and creating the data available to answer that question. Just like when I gave the example on Chinese growth, I mean, for decades, people have creating an ecosystem of how to measure growth around the world in the best possible way. Gotcha, thank you for that, Karen. John, a similar question to you, how does legal in general think about data in the sustainability space? Sure. I think first off, it's important to recognize there's a lot of confusion between data and ratings. And the ESG industry, myself included, hasn't made it any easier. So the, the acronym Environmental Social Governance is both a data idea. So what are your carbon emissions? What is the exact governance profile? But it's also analysis, right? So data is supposed to be a fact. It's supposed to say, hey, a director on a board has been in place for 10 years or five years. But then analysis is trying to put a judgment on that. Is that director still independent? So I think Karen really uh, teed it up nicely that you know there's, there's different needs for data. Certain data, you just want to factually understand what's happening. And then there's other data where you're trying to pull the analysis or, or evaluation from others. The big trend for us and the whole industry is to move everything in-house. So we're trying to create our own points of view and rely less on others. And I imagine it's similar for Karen. Everyone's trying, you know, the industry grew up so fast that we were using others and now everyone's bringing that in-house. So that's the, that's the big trend. I will say there's also two different purposes. Uh, and it mentioned, uh, Karen mentioned that right up front. One of the purposes that we use ESG data for is to raise the standards across the entire board. So we are looking at things like women on boards and 
Um, do you have supplier policies? And we're making that a piece of data that we expect every single solitary company to disclose. That's one purpose, because we want to see the market all rise. There's a different purpose where we're trying to find an investment advantage. We're, we're trying to find value. So that in that type of analysis, we really try to look at a subset of ESG data that's really closely linked, hopefully, to finding mispricings in the market. Gotcha, John. That makes a lot of sense. I wonder also broadly, when you think about what data sets to use, you often have to have conversations with clients about what goals they're trying to achieve from their portfolios. Karen, I'd love to get a sense of what the interaction is with clients when you're dealing with sustainable investments. Because often people have different ideas of what they want out of E, S, and G. Absolutely. And I do think that any investment manager should start with being as clear as possible about your goals. And so just saying, I want to make as much return as possible with as little risk as possible is sort of the standard financial goal I think that clients have. And in that context, uh, more and more, there's just a lot of issues where environmental, social, and government issues is actually just a pertinent part of making money in that market. So for example, if we're going and deciding whether or not we think the price of copper is going to go up or down, you really just can't do that analysis without looking at what's the pace going to be in which the world transitions away from carbon. You just have to ask that question as a way of determining what the future of carbon is. And so there's just a lot of areas where you look into the future, and that's what you do in an investor when you make an investment decision. And to do that, you have to think about environmental and social issues. And I'd say all clients are asking that. All clients are saying, you know, when you're making investment decisions, are you thinking about environmental and social and governance issues as they're pertinent to just making money in the markets? And then more and more there's a transition to a set of clients that also say, you know, in addition to that, I also have sustainability goals, whether it's I want to contribute to the transition on carbon. So I care whether my portfolio is net zero or looking at issues like I care about what the social policies are of the companies I'm investing in because I care about whether or not I'm making money off companies doing things that I don't think are okay. More and more you have investors wanting to have sustainability mandates. It's just part of what they care about the world. Probably the strongest we hear this is from is from pension funds because they're saying, what does it even mean to leave money for my pensioners if I'm leaving behind a world that's not the world they would like to have left behind for them and the people after them? And so once that goal is laid out, to us, that's a little bit of a game changer. Now investing is not two-dimensional risk and return. It's actually three-dimensional risk, return, and impact, or risk, return, and sustainability. And that third dimension deserves just as much care, attention, analysis, systemization, all the hard investment work you expect us to do in minimizing risk. We should now be thinking about maximizing impact. Gotcha. Thank you for that, Karen. And John, I know... Uh, legal in general is philosophy is going to be a little different because you have such a broad investor base and you have such a broad investing strategy. I'd love to get a sense of what the conversations are like with clients when you think about stewardship uh, and your role at the firm. Sure. And I, I, I want to piggyback a bit on, on Karen's f framework because I think it is helpful, right? So the baseline assumption for every investor is they want to make appropriate risk-adjusted returns. That, that is a, a given. Um, there is this other component, which is, you know, they have some interest in improving the world. There's a motivation, right? And so most investors are some combination of those two, right? So either they're 100% make investment return with zero uh, concept of, of, of how that could spill over to society, or I'm, I actually do want to study the improve, how, how my investment dollars could improve the world. And there is a range of actions. So once you start to unpack the motivations and really understand what the client's looking for, there, it turns out it's never that clear, right? So there's lots of different uh, potential actions we could take. So very simply, the most simple known action is divestment. And that's kind of an overused concept. It's, hey, I'm not interested in any fossil fuels. I'm going to cut those fossil fuels out of my portfolio. That's the, the kind of the most classic and more maybe somebody would say the most pure form. But it's, it's become much more complex. There is now, we're a very major investor in, in almost all public companies. We're an index investor. So we have a little slice of every single public company in the market. Well, that actually, and actually that slice is, is big and it's growing. And that slice gives us access to those companies. So we can actually have constructive engagements with 
many of our portfolio companies um, to try to help them to perhaps navigate some of those risks we've identified. If there's a climate change risk, we're navigating. So that's corporate engagement. Then we can also use our proxy votes, which is a, a right of an equity holder. Uh, we could use the media and talk about what companies we think are doing well or not well. So there's a range of activities and they're becoming more and more uh, used in the market and there's much more interest in the market. Gotcha, thank you for that, John. And I'm sure conversations with clients also have to include what's going on in the regulatory world. Um, sustainable investments is not necessarily a you know lifelong ambition or lifelong focus for the SEC. I know there's an ongoing SEC request for comment around this field. I'd love to get a sense, and John, I'll start with you on this one. Um, I'd love to get a sense of what conversations with clients and what conversations with regulators are like in the space. Um, I guess particularly if there's policies you'd like to see pass or um, policies out there that you think will be replicated going forward. Sure. So right now in the U.S., if you are participating in a 401k or a pension as part of your corporation or, or let's say you're a, you're a school teacher, it is legally unclear whether they can have a sustainability fund in your lineup. There's a lot of debate on there, and that is a big problem. Uh, and we do believe that the DOL and the SEC, which are the groups that oversee uh, how this is regulated, uh, will will sort this out. Um, so hopefully that will that's the number one biggest overhang is is, is it's unclear because the the uh, we think incorrect assumption was that pursuing ESG in the past were, were for non-financial benefits, where we believe most ESG analysis is done for financial benefits. So that was just kind of a let's say some sort of confusion in the market. So that's one set of policies uh, that we, we hope will change. There's good signals from the SEC that that's going to change. There are lots of other policies that will help this entire space. So that there is one right now open for comment for the SEC to uh, enforce some sort of mandatory disclosure for climate risk for all companies. Um, we will publicly comment. We hope the market leans into this. We think this is really, really important. You know, one of the, the anchors of the free market is that uh, we all rely on available information. There's a, there, information is out there for everyone. There's no asymmetry of information. For all of us on the inside, we know that that's not true, right? There are, we can engage with companies. Uh, there's, there's lots of different information. You can buy very expensive data that tells you which companies are performing better or worse on climate risk. We want to see that, that data in the market standardized and used more. So really excited to see where that goes. Gotcha. And, no, and Karen, I know Bridgewater obviously operates internationally. Uh, I know there's a, a pretty major policy in Australia that I believe could be a template going forward for, for other countries to, to potentially follow, um, especially around the social aspect of it all. Yeah, it's really interesting how on the environmental side, I think there's sort of been a winner, which is measuring carbon looks like is going to be the winner. It's not the only way to look at environmental sustainability, but with so many governments signing up to have specific pledges around when they're going to go net zero and how, it's getting easier and easier to say, okay, everyone's going to have to measure their carbon. That's going to be the standard and it will align to national policy and so on. On the social side, there hasn't been as clear of a winner of sort of what is good social policy. And we really feel like Australia has been a leader in having uh, modern slavery as a new form of legislation. But they're basically taking an issue where I think almost any investor, if you say, you know, would you like to be profiting off of people's slavery? They would tell you pretty quickly, no. I do not want to be profiting off of people's slavery. That's a pretty easy one. Even if they're just thinking I'm a pure risk and return investor, it's pretty easy to say that's not something I want. But if you actually say, do you have any idea do you know if your investments are indirectly financing modern slavery? The answer usually is no, because, you know, as John was saying, we're all relying on a data ecosystem, and that's a very hard question to answer at this point. And so what Australia has done is basically put this into law, saying that you have to start answering that question. And we see that spurring all kinds of innovation in looking for data, trying to get the answers, trying to have alignment across different players to say, how do we know the answer to this question, and how do we dig deeper? And we wouldn't be surprised if that gets copied and followed and becomes a standard that many people have because of the ease of sort of saying slavery um, is not the sort of thing I want to be profiting off of. But it remains to be seen. I think that space is kind of wide open for different regulators to say, here is what we think are the social things that we'd like to see measured in the same way carbon is measured to be as a basic guide stick and a standard for everybody to know what's going into their investments. And I guess almost combining the two answers here, and John, this is a question for you. 
what type of policies would you like to see, in, or I guess what type of data would you like to see come from companies that would be standardized? Would it be carbon emissions that every public company would be required to, to report? Or, you know, I, I know there's already some diversity stats, but if there's wider ranging, you know, firm-wide diversity stats that could be reported. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any any thought from from you on on what you'd like to see specifically from from a standardization standpoint. Yeah, it's it, it's a very hard question to answer in a in a short period of time. Um, you know, there are emerging standards. I would point to a, a quite well established group which I'm part of called uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which has worked really hard at creating a backbone of. Uh, ESG topics that are are very reasonably material to companies. So that's an industry specific approach. There are other groups that I'm also part of that I think take a top down view. So there's another group called the Human Capital Management Coalition that is advocating for specific metrics um, that help understand your employees. And these are quite reasonable metrics, such as how many part time, full time gig workers do you have? Um, or what is the total cost of your workforce? What is the turnover of your workforce? So right now, as investors, we actually don't know turnover of the investments we're in on a standardized way. That's just an example of, of some of the metrics. There's a lot, though, uh, in terms of what, what the SEC could do. There's a lot uh, wide open to, to, to really move this forward. Bradley, have we lost you? Well, John, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying. Uh, sorry? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying. I think that uh, some of the really interesting hap things happening are new standards. And the thing I would add is that there's basically like before the fact standards, the so things you're looking at to say, I want to go make an investment. And there's been a lot more development in that space to say, I want to go make an investment. What should I know? What does this company do? How? What there has been less evolution on is sort of after the fact. I've bought a company and now I want to know after the fact, what impact did it have? Did it improve? Did it make a difference? And so we often look at the lens of the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a set of frameworks that you know governments around the world have agreed is what it would take to move the world to a more sustainable future. And then we look at that and basically say, well, can we tell after the fact, after we've owned an investment, what has happened and report from that perspective, instead of just doing financial reporting, you're also reporting on what has happened to your investment from an impact perspective. And there, it's really just very early and nascent to not give you some point in time information to help you make an investment decision, but after the fact, tell you when, how, in time series form, what kind of impacts companies did. And so uh, demand from investors to also be reporting on these issues, I think will spur even more of a data ecosystem. I love some of the initiatives that you mentioned, John. I would add to it, um, Harvard Business School's impact-weighted accounts as another really cool way of being able to say, if you had uh, a company, how would you do its accounting if you actually considered its social and environmental costs? So for example, you could look at every company and say, if governments magically started actually taxing all the environmental damage that we're doing, would this still be a profitable company or does it not really have a business model in a world where we tax um, you know, its pollution? That's a, that's a fascinating study and I, I think a, a really good segue to this, this next and, and kind of final topic I want to touch on, which is accountability. Uh, I think specifically, we see so many investors now pitching themselves as sustainability investors or ESG focused. I want to figure out how do your investors hold you accountable to those standards? Um, I know that there's so many metrics out there, but I'd love to get a sense of if there's a uniform way you've seen. Uh, and John, I, if, if you're able, I'd love to love to hear from you first. Sure, it's a, it's a really challenging problem because you know everyone, all investors. Let's be really blunt: all investment managers see ESG and sustainable investing as a commercial opportunity. So everyone is crowded in. And so the question is, how, how do you tell one asset manager from another one? And everyone says that they have the best sustainability credentials. And the hard answer is that you have to do your homework. So uh, I think a very credible group is the principles for responsible investing. Uh, they have a, a public rating on asset managers that I think is very rigorous. So that's one group that you could uh, rely on. Uh, there are also these factual ways you can do it. So if every company, every asset manager says they're they're really um, engaging with companies and voting proxies in very thoughtful ways, 
pick five companies uh, and see how all the different asset managers line up and do they hold the company? Uh, do they engage with them? Um, and, and what do they see? Uh, but I do think this this transparency is, is really hard. And I think uh, our companies are an asset managers transparent on what they're doing. Right. So we spend a tremendous amount of resources trying to explain why we do what we do. And for companies, um, hey, what's important to us so that we we try to use our um, kind of radical transparency to, to, to show companies you should never be surprised with your how we're assessing you on sustainability because we're putting it in the public domain. I'm glad you mentioned radical transparency. I've, I've heard that a few times, listened to uh, Bridgewater founder Ray Dalio speak uh, in the past. Uh, Karen, I'd love to hear about when you interact with companies uh, it, within a sustainability context, what is, you know, what is that conversation like? Is it holding them account via an activism sense? Is it being transparent about what you and your investors hope to accomplish and what they hope to accomplish? Or is it less active and more you guys pick out investments you know will, will act on your values and not really interacting with them much at all? Well, for us, our strength, and I really think every investment manager brings to bear whatever strengths they have in generally doing risk and return to the sustainability topic, for us, a big strength is definitely systemization. The fact that everything we're doing is not based on, you know, an analyst look very carefully on something, but it's a triangulated, systemized, give me any one of thousands of companies around the world and they can give you a standardized, systemized answer to what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what's pertinent in their case and why. And so what that means is we can both answer very clearly, this is why a company is included in our sustainability portfolio. This is what we're seeing. Here's how we triangulated that answer. And this is what would cause a company that isn't included to be included. And we can use that as sort of a map to say, if we're engaging with a company, we can open up that map and say, here are the strengths, here are the weaknesses, here are the issues that need to be addressed. And so we feel like that's just a way of utilizing what is for us 40 years of taking any investment thoughts and finding a way to really truly systemize them and reflect our thinking such that it's scalable and can go to any security in the market and just transferring that sort of strength into the sustainability space. Gotcha. Karen and John, thank you so much today for your insights. Uh, if this panel has taught me anything, it's that we have some of the brightest minds working on this problem right now. So thank you so much for the time, and I'm going to send it back to Meredith in our Insider Studio. Thank you so much, Bradley. What a great and you know really important conversation from Bradley, Karen, and John. And thank you again to all of our speakers to their, for their unique perspectives on financial innovation and the biggest sources of disruption you can expect in the years to come. The implication for the future is clear. Winners and losers will be defined by their ability to transact seamlessly, move money around the world instantly, and invest capital in a sustainable way. A big thank you to you, our audience, for tuning in. Remember to share your thoughts using the hashtag Future of Finance. In a few moments, you'll see our survey pop up on your screen, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Again, thank you all so much for joining, and goodbye.